listening to Dan Rather's America. And welcome back, folks. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome the program once again. We've had him on before, Mark Thompson, who is host of Sirius XM's Make It Plain, was plays in the morning here on Sirius XM Radio. Thanks for coming in this morning. It's always an honor to well, be in your company, sir. Well, it's an honor to have you here. <laughs> Today, I mentioned this before the break. Today is June 19th. That's correct. correct. Also known as Juneteenth or Independence Day, or Freedom Day. Let's remind our listeners about the importance of this holiday. So on June 19, 1865, the news of the Emancipation Proclamation had yet to make it to Galveston, Texas, not to mention a few other places in the South. We didn't have uh, Twitter back then, I guess, or... <laughs> 24-hour basic cable. Had Pony Express. That's right. That's right. (laughs) So Union troops were riding into these communities, letting enslaved people know that, in fact, they were free. And that's exactly what happened on this day uh, 150 years ago, 153 years ago, in Galveston, Texas. Texas. Well, I knew that story. Being a Texan and growing up, uh, being born in Wharton, growing up in Houston, we knew that story. Question. This strikes me, and I'm not, not I'm certainly not trying to be patronizing here, but this is a very important holiday for the country, but it's one that isn't marked and never has been on a widespread basis by the society, by the country as a whole. Sure. And I think memories of even what the date is fade, and so far as I know, it's only taught sporadically. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, you know, I think, a lot of times we don't emphasize parts of history that make people feel uncomfortable, uh, number one. I think, number two, most people focus on the Emancipation Proclamation itself. Um, and so it kind of supersedes or overshadows this holiday. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there should be more attention given to it. I, I wish that would change. Now, frankly, Juneteenth, uh, I've noticed this year and maybe last year, has gotten a lot more attention. Uh, so it's it's getting there. And I know even this morning, Juneteenth was uh, trending on Twitter. Uh, and I've not seen that before. So gradually, I think people you know, get the hang of it. And it it almost uh, mirrors Juneteenth itself. It took a while for that news to make it down south into Galveston. It's taken a while for the news of Juneteenth to make it. But, um, you know, I I appreciate you uh, doing it because, you know, frankly, in the black community, amongst black media specifically and exclusively, uh, we've had to say it and push it out there through the black press and whatnot. Uh, But to have someone like you, and because you know obviously because you are a native Texan, Um, To have someone like you lift up its importance helps a whole lot. Well, if we can help along those lines, always happy to do so. I always worry anything we can do is minuscule, if not microscopic, but we all do what we can. Yeah, no, and you you do, nothing you do is microscopic, (laughs) Dan, rather. (laughs) Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my brother. (laughs) Let's talk as we seldom do. I want to make this part of the conversation candid, real, because I think you'll agree that frequently when we talk about race, particularly when different races talk to one another, we really talk sort of beside one another, beyond one another. Let's get down to basics. Mm -hmm. We had the Trump administration. We had a gentleman call in during our call-in program who said he thinks the president is doing a great job for the country, including what he's doing on the border. But let's talk about what is the central conversation we need to have in this country about race? Look, the country's going to be here, for better or for worse, long after President Trump is gone. Yeah. But uh, what do we need to be discussing about race that we don't discuss? Well, <clears throat> I think that people like you and me play a role in this, and, and I'm sure you, like me, um, lament where journalism and the media has gone and has now arrived. It, there's something terribly wrong, for example— with anyone who agrees with this family separation policy. But I understand how how they got there. Um, We have uh, at least one medium, um, a 24-7 basic cable channel, that promotes this sort of a culture war and disdain for other human beings based on color or background or what have you. So it criminalizes a whole group of people. In this case, of course, we're talking about uh, our Latino sisters and brothers, 
it, it criminalizes them and dehumanizes them to a point where there's some, not most Americans, but just enough who don't hear the cries of those children as troubling as you and I might. We have to do something about that. I think all of us um, have to put our human hats on and say, that sounds like if we had had audio of Dachau or if we had had audio of children taken from the shores of Africa and taken from the plantations. We have history of family. We just don't have audio of that. When I heard that, that's what it sounded like to me. But the problem is when you have a, um, not only just 24-7 basic cable, and I'll say it is Fox, obviously, but then you have um, other media, social media, and people on social media that are not held to account. And I'm not saying that that can be done legislatively. But I think we all have to decry morally some of the things that people are saying and doing and try to fight for a level of humanity to be brought back into the discussion. Um, I, I've i watched you all of my life. I cannot imagine you being in the White House um, briefing room and in, in that press conference yesterday. You, anybody, any other people I grew up watching. Uh, uh, Sam Donaldson, you, nobody. I mean, I can just think, I can see you all's heads almost exploding while someone is literally looking you in the eye and lying to you. What do you and they seem to have no problem with it. They're totally comfortable with doing it. We're, we're at a very different and dangerous place. And unless we can get around that and the rest of us are really willing to talk to each other like you and I are now and say that, this is wrong. It's wrong to do this to these children. It's wrong to call NFL athletes SOBs. But somehow he's managed to play to a base, a small percentage of Americans that watch this this cable channel. You know, we're on radio. And as you know, I've said to people always, it's power of suggestion. So you hear a song you don't like, but the radio station keeps playing that song. And you know what? Within a couple of weeks, you're singing that song. And I think that's the effect that's being that's taking place now. That's I like what the that metaphor doing. because that is the effect. Yes. Yeah. Let me move to something that someone asked me this the other day, a Trump supporter. Sure. Uh, a very intelligent person. I know you think that's an oxymoron. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, There's some. But President Trump regularly brags, he boasts, about the falling black unemployment rate. Right. And and answer to almost every question about race relations. It comes out, listen, I'm responsible for a rapidly falling black employment, unemployment rate. Do you think that has an impact on his standing among African Americans? Those who are uninformed or misinformed, you know, uh, I'll be very honest with you. Um, I mean, we, we had some in the African American community, men even, um, who said to me, they couldn't vote for a woman to be president because the Bible says a woman shouldn't be in charge. I mean, I de debated men in my own community about that. So you do have a small percentage of those that, that may be confused. Uh, and Trump is exploiting that. I think even the pardon of Jack Johnson, the pardon of Muhammad Ali, although none of us can figure out, I'm sure you can't either, what Muhammad Ali needs to be pardoned for, the Supreme Court already exonerated him. So he's he's going to play that and say, look at my African-Americans, the blacks. Um, and I think that's very dangerous. And again, that's why our role is to inform, 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 and, and never stop informing. Now, on the unemployment rate specifically, it has gone down. But as, as you know, and, and hopefully the audience can discern, uh, rarely do presidents change economics on day one or even year one in office. They usually inherit whatever the past president got going. So uh, W. Bush inherited a surplus that he squandered. Uh, Obama inherited a recession that he brought us out of. And now Trump is inheriting some of the post-recession um, success of what Obama yielded. And so it, it, the unemployment rate overall has gone down. But historically in America, and this, this gets back to the question on race and why we have to keep this conversation open. No matter what, if for some reason America the unemployment rate for African Americans has always been twice that of whites. So even if white unemployment, overall unemployment went down to 1%, which would be great, black unemployment for some reason would still be too. 
And, and we see that now even in numbers is double what white. So we still need to have a conversation about why that is, why that is so persistent. And then when you look at, you know, there's also I think we also have a responsibility as journalists to explain to people the unemployment numbers anyway, because, you know, often uh, the true unemployment numbers don't get reported. And we, we look at people who are still in the job market, but for those who've left, then those numbers are not as great and not as good. Well, one thing that uh, it, it, you don't have to be an expert on the economy to know that a persistent problem is the high unemployment rate, particularly among young African Americans. We're talking about boys becoming men 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. That's right. That, that, that the unemployment rate among that segment of our population is even under present circumstances, and I take your point, you know, we had a terrible recession, borderline depression in 2008, yeah. roughly. President Obama, his policies brought us out of that. A lot of people don't want to give him credit for that. On the other end, President Trump has an argument to make that by passing the so-called, I put in quotation marks, the tax reform bill, <laughs> that it gave the economy a shot in the arm. And he can make, yes. an, make an argument. But I do want to underscore the point you made because I need, think people need to understand it that the effect of an incoming president's economic policies are not felt to their fullest and most important and for at least two, two and a half or three years. So sure. it's going to be a while before mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. where we're going with that. I want to come back to this, that when you speak to your listeners mm -hmm. and you take calls, what are they most concerned about? Well, right now, um, lately, this immigration policy, um, but overall, concerned about everything with regards to this administration, Dan. Um, people are really worried about the legitimacy of this, this presidency. Uh, we still talk about the Mueller investigation. We're not going to stop talking about that um, and whether or not he colluded, whether or not he's obstructed justice. Um, frankly, uh, full disclosure, you know, we've had Maxine Waters on a couple times, and so she's kind of quiet lady, a little hard, to bring, <laughs> a little hard to bring her out. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, she coined a, a catchphrase that we use on the show uh, that she's turned into a greeting. So when people see her and greet her, "Good morning, Congresswoman Waters," she says, "Good morning. How are you? Get ready for impeachment." It's kind of a little pleasant thing <laughs> that she says. So she introduced that on our show. So we talk about that when callers call in, they say, get ready for impeachment. Um, and, you know, some of that is tongue in cheek, but people are really, really concerned about that. The the original apple from the poisonous tree was November 2016. And so for a lot of my audience, everything flows from that. This policy that's so prevalent in the news today, the separation policy, um, even the summit. We did a lot of coverage on that. And it is an amazing in this news cycle. Just a week ago, we were the world was obsessing over Kim Jong Un in the summit, and now it's as if it never even happened. I long for that. I, I was telling the story just the other day. I forget where I was, but when um, when I was growing up, and people don't do this anymore, the whole family sat down at the dinner table at the same time and would bless the food. And in the other room in my grandmother's house, uh, CBS Evening News was on, and I would watch Walter Cronkite every night. I long for the days when. The biggest news story was Walter Cronkite stepping down and Dan Rather stepping in. I mean, that was news. And it was nice and simple. and seemed all was <laughs> at peace and quiet. I wish we were back in those days. Well, we're not going back to those days. <laughs> but looking forward, it, we're, and we, we have some time, but I want to come back to the impeachment business. Sure. That I worry that in talking about get ready for the impeachment, quote, right. unquote, right. people talking about the impeachment, that we're creating what could turn out to be a false narrative. My question to you is, if the Republicans maintain control of the House in November, do you realistically think there's any chance of impeachment, whatever Mueller finds out? Well, if that scenario happens, and I hope that's, that's the most unlikely scenario, we can do something about that. I think right now the numbers look good for that not to be the scenario. But to your point, and I think, frankly, we need to be concerned about the Democrats, too, because, you know, there's a school of thought amongst the Democratic leadership that we ought not go down that road either, as quiet as it's kept. Um, there are, and, and you know this well, um, <laughs> better than anyone, 
There are so many parallels to Nixon and Watergate, you know, and people didn't think that was going to happen. But it became so stark. Even Republicans say, oh, yeah, dude, we got to deal with this. I had a listener call the other day and say this, and I, and I think she's right. You know, Mueller's a cool cat. He's sharp. He's doing his job. I don't think he's just going to do a book report. She said, Mark, you all have to accept the fact that Mueller has probably only let us in on about 3% of what he knows and what he's doing. And Dan honestly believed that when that hammer drops, now in terms of Republicans, so think about this. Let's, let's be reminded. He was not their original favorite. They first felt that he hijacked the party from them. And we know all of them have their own self-ambition as well. True. That's the nature of politics. If Mueller comes back with something, and honestly what I think Republicans haven't done, and, and Mueller may help them do this ultimately, why do people think that collusion or interference from a foreign country was only applicable in the general? How did he come out of nowhere and beat every Republican opponent, what, 15, 16 of them? See, they need to ask themselves, did, did he get some help early on in the primaries? And I think if if all of that comes to the surface and Mueller drops a very, you know, powerful gavel down, I think we'll be right back like we were in 1974 and they'll have some things to think about. So, it, it, you know, Maxine says that, but she has she said and this is proven true. She said that he will lead us to his own impeachment. He will be his own undoing. She said we won't have to do anything. And if you look at it, he's been doing a pretty good job of that himself with, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani's help. Well, <laughs> let's see how it goes. It's going to yeah. be an interesting year. Mark Thompson, thank you very much for coming Always this morning. Honor, Always man. appreciate it. And it's I'll see you on your own program soon, my brother. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Thank you, And, Dan. folks, we'll be back just after we take a short break for these messages.